my parents were pretty strict, like they were super loving and they did the best that they could. I just felt like they were just imposing rules on my life and trying to take away my fun. Now I started to believe that God was the same way. I decided I'm going to live life my way for my happiness because I'm clearly missing out and I will deal with God on my deathbed. I was living the life that the world promised me was happiness and fulfillment. I was making tons of money, going to the hottest parties, and by the end of being in that environment for one year, by the end of the year, I I realized that it was totally empty. I moved back to Colorado and my older brother and his wife, they started pursuing me with the love of God. I asked them, why did Jesus have to die? And it was in that moment I realized that he did that for me. I said, God, take my life. It belongs to you. It's yours. My story begins um, when I was two weeks old, my parents separated. Um, my mom wasn't capable of being a mom, my birth mom, and my dad got full custody of us. And he ended up getting remarried when I was five years old to my brother's kindergarten teacher, um, who's my mom today. And she knew Jesus and she loves Jesus. And she actually ended up sharing the gospel with my dad. And, um, and he was saved through that relationship. And they, like I said, they ended up getting married when um, I was five years old. My brother was seven. And I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a loving, um, hardworking Christian home. And I had always been told my whole childhood that Jesus loved me and that he died for my sins. Um, but it never meant anything to me. I just heard it over and over again. Jesus died for your sins. He died for your sins. We went to church every Sunday. I went to private Christian schools. But like I said, it never meant anything to me. And in eighth grade, actually, um, was the first time that I had someone come into my life. It was a childhood friend. She had been transferred into the school that I was going to. And she was rebellious against God. And I admired her. I idolized her. I wanted to be like her. I wanted her life. And I remember one day she asked me, is God really good? Because from what I can see, your parents aren't super great. Uh, your life isn't really that great. And that was the first time that doubt was planted in my heart that I didn't really want anything to do with God. And my parents were pretty strict, like they were super loving and they did the best that they could, um, but they were pretty strict. And I just felt like they were just imposing rules on my life and trying to take away my fun. And now I started to believe that God was the same way that he was just trying to impose rules on my life and trying to take away my fun. So in eighth grade, I decided I'm going to live life my way for my happiness because I'm clearly missing out. And I will deal with God on my deathbed to make sure that I get into heaven. So from there, I started to rebel against my parents secretly. I lived two separate lives. I was one person at home and I was a completely different person around my friends. And this was all in an attempt to find love and acceptance from people. And at some point along the way, I started to believe that who I was wasn't enough. And I would say that was probably around eighth grade with that, that same uh, relationship that I had, that who I was wasn't enough. I didn't wear the right clothes. I wasn't, the, the way that God created me to be wasn't enough. And I started a journey of trying to become whatever my friends and peers around me wanted me to be in order to be loved and accepted. And so I naturally went a direction of rebellion. So my attempt to find love and acceptance was to do all the things that you weren't supposed to do that you could get in trouble for. <laughs> and so 
I started hanging around people that were doing drugs and drinking and, you know, were really turning me against my family, turning me against my parents, secretly behind my parents' back. Um, I started smoking cigarettes. I started drinking alcohol, getting drunk, you know, at parties. In high school, another relationship came along, another friendship that ended up introducing me. This person ended up introducing me into harder drugs. So this person was extremely lost as well. And I just kind of fell under her. And she introduced me to crystal meth. And so I started smoking crystal meth with her in really weird places and really dangerous scenes with older men. And I just kind of went along with it again because I was just trying to fit in somewhere. Um, no, Kristen. Yeah. Two questions. How old were you when you started using crystal meth kind of for the first time? Yeah, that would have been my junior year in high school. So probably around 17. Okay. And before you move forward, could you kind of talk to me about what the relationship with your parents was like? And why was it pushing you to this place where you felt like you needed to go to like harder drugs or even just a deeper rebellion? Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah. So my relationship with my parents, I felt like they never understood me. Like they never really told me why I couldn't do certain things or why I shouldn't do certain things. They just said, don't do it because we said so. That was kind of the relationship we had. And we didn't really have an open dialogue in our home to like question or challenge things. And um, we, my family, we kind of put on this like happy face when we went into church that like, everything was okay, even though there were really hard, broken things happening at home. My relationship with my parents was very broken. I felt like they didn't understand me and that they were never going to understand me. And so we just clashed. So Kristen, take us through now you're using crystal meth. What did that begin to open up for you? What did your life begin to look like at that point where people, you know, trying to intervene? Did your parents ever find out? Kind of take us through what came next. Yeah. So nobody knew what I was doing except for my friends. <laughs> um, and that led to further disrespect and rebellion towards my parents to the point where once I turned 18, they kicked me out of the house. So once I turned 18, um, I showed up one day to my house and all my belongings were in tr pl trash bags on the front lawn <laughs> and the front door was locked and the key didn't work into my home. And the people that I was hanging around with, they, I could have broken in that moment, but they were like, it's fine. Get your stuff. Come with us. Like, it's all good. And so they, they kind of helped me through that transition. So now I'm living with friends. I'm trying to graduate high school. I was going to a private Christian school. And so my parents said, you have to pay for the rest of this if you want to graduate. So I had to get a job. Um, all the while, I was still doing drugs, partying, you know, that kind of stuff. But I did work really hard and I ended up graduating from high school. Now, Kristen, take us to that moment where you found all your stuff like kind of on the street. What was what were you thinking? What were you even thinking about God in that moment, um, as well as your parents when you saw that they had kind of abandoned you? Yeah. So I wouldn't say my parents abandoned me. I was so toxic in the home and so toxic to our family environment that they actually, looking back, they did the right thing. They needed to kick me out. And I was never thinking about God. In that moment, that could have been a broken down moment for me of, oh my gosh, I need to change here. But the people that I was hanging around with just kind of scooped me up and said, don't let this change you or drag you down. We will help you come live with us. I lived with a friend for a little while and then that didn't really pan out. So then my uncle, my dad's brother took me in. I was just kind of hanging out, not doing anything. And he told me, you need to get a job. You can't just be sitting around the house all day. And I didn't have a car. I had no money. So I just started walking to the closest business or restaurant to find a job. I ended up getting a job at a local restaurant and started making money. And in the restaurant industry, it's a pretty big party atmosphere and culture. 
Um, And so I just started making friends at the restaurant and would party after work with um, with these people that I was hanging out with. And eventually that led to a party where I would then meet a future guy that I started dating who was doing heavier drugs like heroin and acid and and these types of things. And so I actually started dating him and it was a really toxic relationship. He didn't believe in God, but I always did. And our relationship actually came to a point where we were going to break up because of that. Even though I wasn't living for God, he was like, no, I, we are gods. And it was this really different belief system. And I was just like, that's crazy. Like, I can't, I'm not going to believe in that. And it actually ended up being like a sever in our relationship. But I continued to party with him. We continued to do drugs. We were just having fun, just living, making money, having fun. I started sleeping around, you know, um, not only with my boyfriend, but even if I was outside of a relationship, like I became very sexually active because again, I thought and believed that this is what guys wanted in order to like me and accept me. And so I gave of myself in that way. And, you know, and looking back, like that was pretty sad, you know, and pretty hard. The things that I allowed myself to get into all for, again, just trying to find love and acceptance. If I can go back a little bit, at the beginning of my testimony, I shared that my parents split up when I was two weeks old. And I didn't realize this until later in my adulthood life was that my birth mother abandoning us is what fueled or helped lead me into a place of feeling unworthy and unacceptable and unlovable. These are the different things that I think impacted who I became in different ways. Now, Kristen, I understand that you weren't really following God. You had a concept of who Jesus was, but you hadn't given your life to him. Take me through up to the point where you had an encounter or maybe, you know, Jesus um, started to enter into your life and maybe things began to change? So at age 20, I moved to South Beach, Miami. The guy I had been dating, he moved out there, convinced me to move out there with him. And while I was out there, I was so attracted to what was happening down in South Beach. It looked so much fun. I was like, I have to be here. So I moved down there. And for the one year that I was down there, so from age 21 to 22, I was living the life that the world promised me was happiness and fulfillment. I lived right on the beach. I was making tons of money, going to the hottest parties. I loved the way that I looked. I was like, this is it. I have everything that the world has promised me is is happiness and fulfillment. And that fun lasted for a little while. And by the end of being in that environment for one year, by the end of the year, I realized that it was totally empty and that nobody really loved me or cared about me who I was hanging around. I wanted to be truly loved. And I knew that even after all that I had put my parents through and put my family through, that they still loved me. And so I decided I'm moving back to Colorado because I want to be around the people who actually really love me. And so I moved back to Colorado and my older brother and his wife, they started pursuing me with the love of God. They never talked about God. They never talked about Jesus. They just wanted to be around me and hang around me. And they spoke life into me, something that I hadn't heard in any of the the circles that I was around, people just tore me down all the time and made fun of me. And now I'm hanging around my brother and sister-in-law who are just building me up with everything. They're just like, wow, in all sincerity, you are just so pretty, Kristen. Like even without makeup, you're just so fun. You're just so fun to be around. And all these masks that I had put on of this person that I had become to find love and acceptance started to come off. I started to realize I don't have to be Kristen that smokes cigarettes anymore. I don't have to be Kristen that knows drugs and knows how to do drugs. I don't have to be Kristen that will sleep with you. I can just be me and that's enough. And I was so attracted to that that I didn't want to be hanging around any of the people that I was hanging around anymore. And so 
I just wanted to be with them. So wherever they were, I was. And so they were at Wednesday night Bible studies. They were at church on Sunday, you know? And so I was just with them all the time. And that's when God started to work in my heart and the Holy Spirit started to touch me. And I remember one day at church on Sunday, we were there and I was just there because I wanted to be with my brother and sister-in-law. And uh, I felt the Holy Spirit like come upon me. And I, I remember thinking to myself like, whoa, what is this? You know, shortly after that, I remember I was sitting on their bed one day. I'm 22 years old at this point. I asked them, why did Jesus have to die? I had been told my entire childhood, Jesus died for your sins, but I never understood why. And it was in that moment that God brought me to that moment. And I asked them, why did he have to? And they explained to me in a way that I could understand the way that God had set up this system of sacrifice and how if you wanted to be made right with God back in the Bible times, that you had to sacrifice a pure, innocent animal to make right make things right for the sin that you had committed. And that animal sacrifice could never be enough to make us right with God for all of the sin, um, past, present, future in our lives, that Jesus came down and said, I'm going to be the ultimate sacrifice so that you can be with me in heaven one day. And it was in that moment that it was my salvation moment. I realized that he did that for me and that he loved me that much that I said, God, take my life. It belongs to you. It's yours. And from that moment on, I was a brand new creation. Like the Bible talks about the old is gone. The new has come. I knew in that moment, from that moment on, that I was never going to have sex before marriage again. I knew I was never going to be doing drugs or drinking anymore. I knew that I was going to start dressing modestly because I wasn't dressing modestly prior to that. And that I had fallen in love with Jesus. And I just talked to him all the time and was just so desperate. I was like, God, just show me your face. You know, you're the first person that I talk to when I wake up every morning. You're the last person I talk to when I go to bed every night. Show me your face. It was from that moment on that everything changed. Now, Kristen, take us back a little bit to the moment you first felt the Holy Spirit. For people who have never experienced the tangible presence of God, can you just describe that to us a little bit? When I first felt the Holy Spirit come upon me, it was like tingling just all over my body. And this this powerful sort of presence is what it felt like. So now that you were saved and you were able to give your life to Christ, what was that feeling like? Did it increase? Did you get to experience God more even as you were asking Him to kind of show Himself to you? What was your life beginning to look like as you were saved? The biggest things that I can remember was that all of a sudden I had peace. I had never known what peace was. I never knew that I needed it or wanted it, but all of a sudden I was experiencing peace and joy. Could you go into a little bit more detail about what your life looked like after? Because now you're leaving this complete lifestyle of, you know, drugs and promiscuity, all these things begin to show us how did God transform that? Was it an overnight thing? You never touched those things again? Or was it a process? And can you take us through your process? Yeah. So it was an overnight thing. No more cigarettes, no more drugs, no more drinking, no more sex. That was that was a pretty immediate overnight thing. My language cleared up. All of a sudden, I was just full of joy, like I mentioned. And I started to become a better person overall um, that people started to notice at work because I I was working at a restaurant at the time. I just wanted to live for God. I, I remember going into work and being like, I just became a Christian. I can't work Sundays anymore. Like, I'm, I'm going to church. And... I just remember being filled with the joy of the Lord and being set free. And I understood for the first time the words in the song from Amazing Grace, I once was blind, but now I see. And I I realized for the first time that God wasn't trying to take away all my fun. He was trying to protect me from all the destruction and the harm that that fun that I was trying to have brought to my life. Kristen, can you tell us a little bit about what your life looks like now? 
When was it that you got saved? 2006, I think. <laughs> so it's been a little while that it's you've been, been walking with the Lord. Can you take us through what that walk looks like and where He's brought you to even today? Yes. So one thing I forgot to mention is that I developed an eating disorder throughout this whole thing. So when I was lost, super lost, just trying to find love and acceptance, I hated my body. I hated the way I looked. I hid behind tons and tons of makeup. And I developed an eating disorder because I believed if I was just skinny enough, then I would attract the right guys and the guys would want me. And so I was smoking crystal meth to be skinny, and I also had an eating disorder. And after I gave my life to Christ, all the drugs and, you know, abusing alcohol and that kind of stuff immediately went away. I had to say goodbye to that friend group that I was hanging out with, literally contact each one of them and say, I'm taking a different path in life, and we're not hanging out anymore. And the eating disorder behavior went away for a little while, but it came back. And I was so ashamed of that because now here I was thinking internally, oh my gosh, Kristen, like you're a Christian. You shouldn't be dealing with this kind of stuff anymore. And I continued in secret that behavior for a while, for years, even as a Christian, because I was so ashamed. I eventually got to a place a few years after I gave my life to Christ where I was like, I'm done with this. I can't live this way anymore. I am a slave to this addiction because that's what it is. It's an addiction. And I remember writing in the little attendance pad on for church on Sunday, I have an eating disorder and I need help. And it was from that very moment that one of the pastors saw it and he got me connected with somebody in the church who had had that sort of same history too. And uh, she started meeting with me one-on-one -on -one in Starbucks, just a coffee shop. And she started to put God's Word in front of me, and she would say, I want you to read out loud what God says about you. And as I did that, I started to believe what God said about me in His Word. And that, in about a short span of about eight weeks, led to my complete deliverance of this addiction that I had had for so many years. And I had talked to other eating disorder counselors to, to receive help from them. And they said that they have never experienced anybody receiving full freedom from this addiction, but God brought it to me in a very short amount of time when I filled my mind and believed His Word about who He says I was. So take us into your life now. Has the Lord yeah. kind of put you into ministry or what are you doing um, for God now? Yes, so... I had, like I said, when I first, when God captured me and He pulled me out of the pit of darkness and put me on a hill and filled me with His light, I just wanted everybody to know Jesus. To this day, I just want everybody to know Jesus. But back then, about 14 years ago, those same deep-rooted insecurities that I had before Christ carried on into my life with Christ. As I was sharing Jesus with people at work and in my life, any sort of negative reaction or response that I received caused me to feel insecure and caused me to be silent. And so I never stepped into a place of sharing the gospel with people and giving them an opportunity to respond to Jesus, but I unashamedly lived my life as a Christian and started serving in youth ministry. Because of what I went through as a teenager, I wanted to help other teenagers not make those same mistakes and, you know, and help walk them through that. So for about the last 10 years, I worked with youth groups at, at whatever church I was at. And and that was fun and it was fulfilling and it was such a cool opportunity to be um, a mentor to young girls that were struggling with different things and that I could help them with that. But looking back, I realized that that passion that God put inside of me the moment I gave my life to Him, that I want everyone to know Him was actually God telling me that this is what I want you to do and how I want you to spend your time. I want you to go be my witness to the ends of the earth. 
And so for 14 years, I did not do that. I served in the church and mentored young girls and worked, you know, with other Christians in different ways, but I wasn't fulfilling what God is actually asking me to do. And so for the last year, about a year and a half ago, I saw a friend on Facebook standing on a stage in Africa with a microphone in hand, proclaiming the gospel to hundreds of African children below her, and they were all raising their hand to say yes. And it was in that moment that God reminded me, that's what I created you to do. And so when she got back from Africa, I was talking to her and I was like, how did you get here? How did you, you know, teach me everything, mentor me. She took me under her wing for a little bit, um, but she got busy with the call that God has on her life. And she told me that Christ for All Nations, an organization called Christ for All Nations, um, has an evangelism training called Fire Camp. And I went there in January of this year and it was a one week intensive training for people who feel called to be evangelists of the United States, which I do. And by the beginning of the week, I was scared to share my faith, didn't really know how to share the gospel in a clear, concise way. And by the end of the seven days, I was on a mic in the streets of downtown Orlando, street preaching and doing one-on-one -on -one evangelism. And it was in during that week that the lion that's inside of me was just released. And from that moment on, I have humbly repented that I have not been doing what God has asked me to do. And he shared with me and he, and he showed me and he reminded me, Kristen, one day you will stand before me and give an account for your life. And are you ready to do that with the life that you've been living? And I realized no. And I, I remember I, I said, God, have mercy on me. Forgive me and allow my life to continue on for many, many years so that I can carry out what you called me to do many years ago. And so from that, that moment on at the beginning of this year, that is what I've laid my life down to. Not only prioritizing being a mom and raising my, the disciples that he's given me within my family and loving my husband well, but that when we are out, we are full-time Christians and we are sharing the gospel with the people that we meet at the grocery store who come across our path at the grocery store, at Walmart, at the restaurants, whoever's serving our table. And we're just excited to see where this goes because we believe that He's going to start bringing us people that want to be discipled by us. And so we've cleared a spot in our schedule ready for that, that as people come and they receive Jesus through our time with them and they accept the gospel, that we have a place for them to come and start discipling new believers. Kristen, who is Jesus to you? <laughs> yeah, He's everything to me. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my best friend. He is my addiction breaker. He is the one that gives me my identity and says who I am. And like I said, He, he took me out of a dark pit, pit and put His light inside of me so that I can shine for Him and for His name uh, to, to all the world. What words of encouragement do you have for the people who may be watching who are doubting or may have the question, is God really good? Yeah, He's real. He is alive and He is not going to force Himself on you. He is standing at the door of your heart knocking, waiting for you to open it to Him. And, can, and I just want to encourage anybody that's watching this that any life that you are living for yourself or apart from God, you are missing out on the most satisfying, fulfilling life that you could ever have. Do you have any advice for the people who are watching who feel like they aren't accepted or even worthy enough for the call that God has placed or given them? One of my favorite verses in the Bible is in Ephesians. I believe it's Ephesians 1.6. And it says that you are accepted in the beloved. And that is a verse that I've stood upon and that I would encourage anybody to reflect upon is that He has made you acceptable. 
It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter the shortcomings or the things that you're struggling with even today. You can rest and know that you are accepted already by Him just the way that you are. And I just want to encourage anybody that's watching this to ask God, go into the secret place and ask God, God, what is it that you want me to do? Use me to the full. My life is yours. I lay down my will, not my will, but yours be done. And He will show you and begin to take those steps. He will use you in a mighty way if you are just obedient to whatever He's asking you to do. Kristen, do you have any last words for the people who are watching? I just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to my story and my testimony. And I can humbly say that this is not about me. I just get to be His witness. And I just get to be another testimony of who He is and how He's worked in my life and that He wants to do the same, if not more, in yours. And so you can trust Him with everything. He's a good Father. And you can lay down everything, your worldly goals, dreams, desires. You can lay it all down and trust that whatever He has is way better than what you could ever go after or or try and pursue apart from Him. Kristen, we would love it if you could just pray for the people who are watching who may be connecting to any parts of your story today. Yeah. Father God, I just thank you for this moment. I thank you for the ways that you've radically changed my life and that you want to see other people who are struggling with the same things that I did or who are struggling with the same things that I did have recently, that you want to set them free of all of that. And that that I just pray, Lord, that this would be a moment, a moment where people who are struggling with addiction would say, I'm not going to live this way anymore, and I'm going to turn to you, God, and get help. And I just pray, Father, that anyone who is living for themselves, who is following after you, but living for themselves, that you have something more for them, and that you've placed something powerful and a passion on our heart. And I just pray that from watching this testimony and from this moment right now, that they would forsake all of that and leave it behind and turn to you and give you everything, all of them, all of their life. You're so good, God. Thank you for the mercy that you pour on me and that you pour on all of us and that we can come to you and stand before you one day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' mighty name. Hey, everybody. I hope the new testimony has blessed you, has encouraged you. Just wanted to let you know that if you are in need of help, that we have people that are ready to speak with you. So down in the description box below, in the comment section, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, if you're listening from our podcast, just look for the link that says, talk to someone who cares. Click on that, fill out the form, and somebody will get in contact with you locally. Now, this is only available to people in the US right now, but we are working to get resources for our international viewers and listeners. But for right now, if you are in the U.S. and you need help, you need to talk with somebody, please fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next testimony.